Good morning to you that are just uh, logging in now. We'll be waiting just a minute or two and give uh, a few more people an opportunity to get connected. Well, good morning. Uh, it's good to be back with you. And again, for anyone that might be joining us that uh, doesn't know me, my name is Mark Palladino, longtime friend and associate of uh, Lord of the Harvest and particularly Pastor Oz. We go back a long way. Uh, this is the third of uh, three visits that I'll be having with you. Pastor Oz has asked me to do three sessions. And so this will be the third and final, although I hope it's not the last. Uh, we have uh, opportunities in the future to continue to minister. It's always a pleasure to minister and share the word with you all. And uh, um, so before we get started, uh, why don't we just take a moment and uh, go before the Lord and ask his uh, guidance and his ministry uh, of the word to us today. Father, we thank you uh, as we uh, come together this morning. Uh, both in the uh, adult Bible study here at Lord of the Harvest, as well as the, uh, the, the, the services, the ministry of the word that be going on, not only here, but in churches all across the world, as we celebrate this amazing and incredible day called Pentecost. And remember, Lord, today the, uh, the, the gift that you sent to us on this day, that glorious Holy Spirit sent from heaven, to begin to renew the process of renewal of your people and the ingathering of your people into the kingdom of God to fulfill your glorious purpose, Lord. And so we want to just uh, take a moment to soak that in and, and recognize and remember and consider all that the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives and what that means, the very spirit of life uh, that has been bestowed upon us that gives us a quickening now, today, in our lives as well as who will quicken our mortal bodies uh, to live eternally with you, Lord. So we thank you for that unspeakable gift. Help us, Lord, as we just uh, uncover a little bit about the background of this uh, this day and this uh, memorial. And, uh, uh, and we just ask, Lord, that in all things that Jesus be glorified. Again, we ask in his name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining today. And again, welcome to the Lord of the Harvest uh, uh, adult Bible study, Sunday morning Bible study. Uh, by the way, if you happen to notice me shifting in my chair, it's because I've had this long list of back surgeries and I'm constantly trying to keep my low back supported in the chair. So I apologize if I hope that's not too distracting. But, uh, you know, as we get ready to go into the word today, folks, it's, you know, I know many of you, I can see your names uh, popping up here and your good friends and, uh, so I don't have to play minister or play Bible teacher here, but I'm going to put my Bible teacher hat on for a minute. And uh, I was just reminded this week um, that I think that for some of us, and if the shoe fits, I'll just ask you to wear it. We need to get back to engaging the story of God. I mean, we are, our lives can begin to get borne along by activities and events and and things that we have to do, whether we're having problems or whether we're having successes or whether we're working or not working whatever our, the case of our life, we can just begin to find ourselves born, aligned, born along by the situations and carried along by life itself. And, you know, I was just reminded again uh, this week, uh, as I was thinking about what I wanted to share with you, I wasn't really sure what direction I wanted to go, what the Lord would have me to go. And I just felt inclined in prayer to go back and take a look at the Exodus. You know, and I thought, Lord, I've, I've I've taught on the Exodus at Lord of the Harvest. I've taught it in other places. A lot of what I would have there is probably not new. 
But as I went back in and began to read the story, beginning at the Exodus 1, and just got myself reabsorbed in the story, I, I just realized how, how much or how little, how much we miss when we just are grabbing a verse here, a verse for the day, or uh, uh, just looking at maybe a character, this char that character, and, or looking at the Bible as though it's a self-help manual for you know, my personal life, and not taking the time to just absorb the story of the God of history and how he was involved and his hands were involved with operating in human life and in his people. And, and I think, you know, just to be honest with you, I think we who teach and minister the word are the worst, the worst offenders, because we tend to find ourselves inadvertently looking at books and Bible and stories, and we're looking to get a word. You know, there's a tendency to have to find something to say to them and not allowing God to just cleanse and wash our minds and re-engage just who he is. And, and today, as we look at the, 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 the little bit about the Exodus story and its implications, um, it just, I'm always taken back. I'm always uh, just re-energized at seeing how the God of history ordained these events and how they would point to something so much greater uh, to, as, a, as the countdown to the Messiah began and how the Passover and the, the giving of the law at Sinai and the creation of Israel as a people were all uh, shadows of something so much greater that was to come. And all this was ordered by the God of history. And it just reminds us how much in control he is of not only history, but everything that touches our own lives. And so I want to encourage you to just, you know, open that book and just absorb the story. Forget about what you need to say to other people. What you, God wants you to give to others will, will come out. It will, it will fall out of that meditation in, in the Word itself. So as we look at uh, the Exodus, of course, uh, this is all going to lead up, this being Pentecost Sunday, and I'm not sure what Pastor Oz and Pastor Jan has in mind to share today, but, you know, Pentecost is a special day for the Jews as well as the Christians, and uh, it, it's called Shavuot, or, or the, the Festival of Weeks, and, and it, it occurs seven uh, weeks after Passover, and it, uh, uh, it links us to uh, both the Exodus and Israel's establishment as a nation through the law of God. And it really kind of amazing how it parallels this arrival of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Shavuot was an event originally in, in Leviticus 23 given as a, a uh, harvest festival where the Israelites would bring their first fruits of the wheat, I believe it was, into to present before the Lord. And, and later on as uh, as uh, after the temple was destroyed, it was became also known as Atzeret, which meant completion, because they began to celebrate the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, and that was seen as the completion of the the Exodus story, the 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 uh, uh, the giving of the law, which followed when they began to see that the Exodus was for the purpose of the giving of the law, and so uh, they celebrated both. Of course, for Christians. It works very much the same in parallel, and we'll look at those parallels a little bit more closely in a minute. But um, it, it, it is the it is the giving of the Holy Spirit after uh, the Passover, after the, the cross of Christ, the cross and the resurrection, where we see that, that God uh, completes His uh, a redemptive work by not only uh, bringing forth our redemption through the cross, but creating a new creation, sending that great dove out, uh, like the one that was sent out in. Uh, from the ark in the days of Noah, that it would never again return, you know. And so the Spirit was given to us now to uh, begin to go through the world and through his people and bring forth a new creation everywhere he settles. Um, the Exodus it's, itself is uh, maybe the most single defining moment for the nation of Israel. It was the beginning of this process wherein an enslaved uh, group of tribes uh, in, in Egypt uh, would be, become a holy nation. And the, the, the uh, Exodus is preceded by Passover as we turn to Exodus 12. Uh, in, in Exodus 12, we read, of course, the Lord has called Moses in these early chapters of the book of Exodus. He's called Moses. Israel's been enslaved for 400 years. 
and he calls Moses to be the deliverer. And of course, L Moses, the great man of faith and power, three times in the course of that uh, 10 or 11 chapters, says, Lord, I ain't a good talker, you know, and uh, the Lord reminds him, uh, you know, who made your mouth, Moses? And okay, I'll accommodate you. Uh, you'll you'll be God. I'll tell you what to say, and I'll let uh, your your brother Aaron be your your uh, uh, prophet, and he'll speak in your behalf. So God has a way has a pretty interesting sense of humor. But um, the the beginning of, uh, of of the story here of the Exodus begins in chapter twelve of Exodus, and it says the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, "This month shall be the beginning of months for you." For it is the first month of the year to you. So speak of the, to the congregation of Israel and saying that on the tenth of this month, they are each to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor uh, nearest to his house shall take one according to the number of persons in them and according to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. And of course, immediately we are we see that something is afoot. A calendar change means a new creation for the people of God, for this people Israel. It's it's something new is about to happen, and it's seen as a new creation, a new identity, a new loyalty for them. The, 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 the God's timing, God's plan, God's purpose, God's new creation is not going to go back to the to the beginnings of a fallen world that that is. Uh, been brought under sin by Adam, but that it's going to have a redemptive context to it, and that the new creation will begin. Uh, that that the old slavery, which is uh, was personified in Pharaoh in, in Egypt, would be no more. But before this great exodus can return uh, begin, before this great exodus can occur, a Passover must take place. A lamb has to be slaughtered. A sacrifice has to be given. So the lamb becomes the first item on the agenda. And we see that it is a lamb that is shared not only by individuals, but for our households, as well as our community, our communities. And so immediately, by the way, we have a, a connection to the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul mentions to us that, the, uh, that Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And we see that these sensational events in this great exodus in these great moments of Israel's history, late history, really prefigure uh, New Testament realities. They're not to be understood as an end in themselves. And we, like Israel, will be passed over by the angel of death at the cross. So we go to the Lamb, and in verse 5, Paul uh, or Moses gives us most of his attention now to the Lamb. He says, your Lamb shall be unblemished, uh, an unblemished male a year old. And you may take it from the sheep or the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month. And then the whole assembly uh, of the congregation is to kill it at twilight. And right away we see that uh, the New Testament connection to First Peter, that the lamb is to be unblemished. The lamb is to be foreordained, as we read in First uh, Peter 1, where he tells us that the lamb Christ was foreordained and was without spot, without blemish, for us, and here he's killed by the by the children of Israel, and we know that that Israel had the hand in bring putting their own Messiah to the cross, and then he goes on to say that um, you shall keep it to the fourteenth day. That's the preordination of the lamb. He's he's known selected ahead of time, and he's killed at twilight, and literally that means between the two evenings. The, the Israelites had uh, two two twilights where the the time of noon where the sun was at its zenith and, and, the, and the time of twilight when the sun was falling, both were considered as uh, uh, evenings or the beginning of an evening or the twilight period. So this afternoon period is precisely when Jesus was crucified. He says, then you shall take some of the blood and you shall put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat. So this blood was placed on the lintel, which is the, the head post over the top, and on the two sides, the, the door post. But notice that it was not put on the threshold, because the writer of Hebrews in chapter 10 tells us that we should not be trampling under, taking for granted the blood of Christ, that it is our covering, and that is it is the covering for our house 
in, in that, but never is something that should be on the threshold of our lives where it's something that we could take for granted and just uh, and trample it under. He goes on to say that they shall eat the flesh the same night roasted with fire and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Not, they should not eat any, any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head, its legs, along with its entrails. And this, only the, the roasted lamb can be eaten, folks. You know, the roasted lamb is the, the roasting by fire. That's a symbol of judgment. That the lamb that we must consume and we must invite others to consume is not Jesus the teacher, not the boiled watered down Jesus, not the good man. The only, the only lamb that is there for us to be eaten, to be taken into our lives, is the roasted lamb, the one who was, was, was judged in our place. So that he's to be, he is to be roasted with fire. And that's the only one. And he says that we're to eat, um, uh, we're to eat uh, all of it. That 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 in verse nine, that any of it raw or boiled with water, but rather the roasted with fire, both its head, legs, and its entrails. We see three symbols there: head, legs, and entrails. Which means we don't get to pick what we want. We don't get to pick the parts of God that we want to pick. His head, his headship, his leadership, his lordship over our lives is part of the package. His, his legs, his walk, his life is emulating his walk in life. And thirdly, his inner life, his heart, his entrails, that we walk in the love of Christ. We love as he loved. And so we take the whole Christ, and, and this is the one that was crucified for us. And there are no leftovers, you know. Yesterday's faith is not good enough for today. Yesterday's successes, yesterday's victories, yesterday's uh, faith in the Lamb is not going to carry us today. Each day is new, has a new journey of its own. He says, you'll eat it with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste, for it's the Lord's Passover. You know, you didn't normally sit at a meal in Israel. As a matter of fact, you didn't enter, enter a home. The ancient Orientals didn't wear shoes and sandals in the house, and they didn't carry their staffs around in the house. But for Israel, there's to know that no matter, even when they were at rest eating, that they were on a journey, that this was the beginning of a journey for them. And that's our lives. Our lives are a journey in Christ, aren't they? We're not understood to be part of this world, but that we're, we're journeying, we're aliens, we're sojourners in this world, God tells us. And we're to, kind of interesting here, the, the, the girding up, you know, the ancients would take their outer garment, they would gird it up and they would kind of tuck it into their waist belt so it didn't impede their movement. And that sort of suggests to us to get things out of the way that would impede you on this journey, okay? Just, you know, everything that would, there's this whole preparedness in life to be, to be moving, to be journeying, to be looking ahead to what God has for us. And then finally, he goes on to say that um, uh, he's going to go through the land of Egypt that night and will strike down the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and all, against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments, for I am the Lord. The blood will be for a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you when I strike the land of Egypt. Very interesting. The Lord says, I'm not going to pass over you because you're righteous. I'm not going to pass over you because you're so innocent. I'm going to pass over you because I've chosen you by grace and you've, you've obeyed the, the commandment to cover your life with the blood of Christ. And that's what makes us distinct is having been uh, covered with the blood of Christ, of having exercised our faith that that blood would be a protection against the angel of death. And so God is reminding us here that, no, you're not innocent. You're, you're chosen by grace and forgiven because of my goodness because of my sovereign choice of you and you need to remember that in israel along the way i think in their in their journey in in, in the, the centuries to follow maybe forgot that and then Mo, and then moses turns to the story turns to a stress on cleaning out the leaven and this becomes a very very important part of our understanding of the communion table he stresses how important it is to 
to make sure that their houses are clean from leaven. Now, this is the this day in verse 14 shall be a memorial. He sets up a memorial, just as Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. He's looking back because we know that, of course, the, the Passover itself, uh, or the, 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 the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper took place on the Passover. It was a Passover meal. And so the Lord's reflecting on this very thing. Do this now in remembrance of me, not in remembrance of the Exodus, but in remembrance of me. But our lesson from it is that this is a memorial and you shall, ce shall celebrate it as a peace, feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses for whoever eats uh, eats anything leavened on the first day of the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. And on the first day, you shall have a holy assembly, another assembly on the seventh day, and no work shall be done in them except that must be eaten by each person. Uh, that alone may be prepared by you. And he just goes on to stress throughout their generations that the, a significant aspect of this celebration is get rid of leaven. And Paul reminds us when he says in 1 Corinthians 7 that, that to purge out the leaven of malice and wickedness. And this is a process that isn't just, you know, we, you know, we pick up that, that wafer and that cup sometimes at communion and we're, we're trying to find this repentance all of a sudden. And, and, and we're trying to, you know, feel something special that's going to take place. But here the Lord is saying, you know what? All along, the process is purging out leaven of malice and wickedness. The whole period before this, the whole seven days is, should, be, should be a part of our lives to be, to be preparing our hearts before the Lord so that when we come together to celebrate the table of the Lord, there is a cleanliness that is, that is already occurring in our lives and in our relationships, you know? That leaven is, 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 is often, not always, but often, refer to something that leavens the whole lump, that changes the character of things, and malice toward one another, backbiting and, and wicked behavior, behavior as unbecoming saints, that is something that we need to be mindful of day by day. And the, the Jews, uh, uh, this is in a, in a sort of a uh, characteristic uh, tradition, go through their homes with with a candle looking for every possible corner of the house where there might be this little fragment of leaven to be cleaned out, of yeast to be cleaned out of the house. And so Paul says we should eat this bread and drink this cup with sincerity and truth, with authenticity, free from hypocrisy, free from phoniness, free from religion, free from uh, having uh, uh, issues between one another. You know, to keep the community cleansed from all of this, it's all leaven. It's all things that, that leaven the lump. And then finally, Moses goes on to tell us uh, in verse 25 that when you enter the land which the Lord will give you and he has promised you and you observe this right, and when your children say to you, what does this right mean to you? You shall say it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians, but spared our homes and the people bowed and low in worship. And so we are given something to teach our children what the Lord has done for us when we gather. This is a foundational teaching for our children to understand as they begin to become old enough to partake of this communion. And they ask, what are we doing here? And you, you can tell them, this is because we are celebrating what the Lord has done for us at the cross. This is because we are celebrating the consuming him by faith and drinking his blood that forgives us of our sins. And we are commanded to make sure that that is deeply ingrained in the lives, in the minds, in the hearts of our children, that, that, that this is what makes us distinct from all the other peoples of the world. So as we move on in the Exodus story, the Exodus is not the end in itself. The Passover is not the end in itself. 12 to 14, as Israel leaves Egypt after great judgments that come across, that come upon them, and this Passover night when the angel of death goes through the land of Egypt, 
Pharaoh is in, in chapters 12 to 14, Pharaoh is in pursuit and they cross over the great story of the Red Sea crossing. The enemy, the Pharaoh, the Egypt is left behind them. And this Paul uses this in 1 Corinthians 10 to remind us that that's what our baptism is. You know, this great story of the Red Sea parting. And Paul's, yeah, that's your baptism. You know, they were baptized unto Moses, you know, and that's the like figure that is our much like our story, so that you are leaving when in that baptism, you are leaving Pharaoh behind. You are leaving everything that represents the chains of your former life, whatever sin, whatever bondage, whatever um, system that you were held to is being, is, is being brought to its end in, in our baptism. And they wander. Chapter 15 to 19, God gives them manna and he gives them water from the rock. And they come to Mount Sinai in, verse, in, in chapter 19. And there they camp and the laws are given. And this is the Pentecost. This is the, 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 the seven weeks later where now the law is given. And that becomes very important, that, that establishment, because this now takes this, the group of slaves from their place and, and this is where the nation is formed as a people and defined by God's laws. And Moses then in chapter 24 is called up to Mount Sinai and the elders are there. And I mentioned this last time, the elders go up with him and they sup with God, they meet with God. And through the course of the next six chapters from chapters 25 to 31, we see uh, a new creation. We see uh, through the course of these chapters, the tabernacle is being created as a new holy space, a new throne uh, a place for God to sit and encamp among the children of Israel. And six times the Lord speaks to Moses from chapter 25 through uh, 34. And it ends, it culminates in chapter 31, 1, where he institutes, or 31, 12, where he institutes the Sabbath for Israel, just as he, uh, he, he instituted the Sabbath rest for himself on the seventh day. And by the way, church, that Sabbath, you know, Jesus, when Jesus said, come unto me, all you who labor and give and, uh, and, uh, and are, are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He was not saying, I will give you naps. He's not saying, I'll give you couches to rest on, sleep on. He was saying, I will give you enthronement. I will give you power over all that was before. I will give you power over the enemy. I will give you power over sin. Just as uh, in Isaiah 66, 1, he says, where is, where is my, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. You know, where is the place of my rest? Where am I enthroned? This place of rest for God's, God's rest is his enthronement. The, the creation in the, in, the, in the first chapter of Genesis was not just God making stuff. It was God building his holy tabernacle, his place of enthronement where he would, he would rule the universe, through, rule the earth and all through man. And so Jesus invites us to participate in that. And even as God institutes the rest, Yes, you toil by the sweat of your brow. Yes, you work the six days. Yes, you have to provide. And yes, you have to work the field. But on this day, you're going to sit down and you're going to be reminded that you are not ruled by this production and consumption world that you live in. That I have given you a place of rest and enthronement over everything. And so we see this progression through the book of Exodus. And the story takes us all the way through as Israel wanders in the wilderness and they come to uh, 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 the brink of entering the land and the book of Deuteronomy is written and there Moses speaks to them. And this becomes the final installment of what God has done for Israel. And this is bringing me, by the way, if you think, not sure why I'm talking about all this and what it has to do with Pentecost. Okay, we're going to kind of tie all this together now in the next few minutes. Because first of all, the purpose of Exodus 12, that Passover story and that Exodus, 
the purpose of that is Exodus 19. Because there in Exodus 19, the law is given. It's not enough just that Hebrew slaves were taken out of their bondage. As a matter of fact, it's very dangerous only to think in those terms. Back in, gosh, in Amos, Amos chapter 9, take a minute to read it, 9-7, Walter Brueggemann refers to this as Exodus in the plural. The first time I read this and heard him talk about it, it just it flipped my lid. The Lord says through Amos, are you not like the children of Ethiopia to me? Don't you know that I've delivered other peoples from oppression besides you? Do you think it's just about being delivered from oppression? Not at all. And the meaning here is that they were delivered out of something to be delivered into something. And in fact, it says that in, in Deuteronomy 6. The Lord brought you out in order to bring you in. That the, the purpose of Exodus 12, the purpose of Passover, the purpose of the deliverance from Egypt, the purpose of leaving them all behind is to free you from all other loyalties so that I could form you with my law and make you a distinct people. And those of you who were very much a part of my Bible orientation class, remember how much I hammered this these verses in Deuteronomy chapter 4, I refer to it as the Deuteronomic hope. As Moses in his farewell address, which is what Deuteronomy really is all about, Moses giving the final uh, giving of the law with emphasis on justice and service to God. And in Deuteronomy 4, very easy to remember, Deuteronomy 4, verses 5 and 6, 4, 5, 6. He says, see, I have taught you the statutes and the judgments just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. So to keep them so that this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all of these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people for what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God whenever we call on him. That actually goes to verse 7. So Exodus 12, the purpose of Exodus 12 is, a, is Exodus 19. The purpose of deliverance is the formation of a people under the law. But the purpose of the formation of the, of the people under the law is Deuteronomy 4. It is for witness to the nations. Ultimately, God's formation of his people is for his witness to the heavens so that, so that there may be a reflection of what is heavenly on the earth. Again, in, in another, another, just a phenomenal verse, one, again, one of my favorites, this is seen so vividly in Isaiah 51, where we see five, five critical dynamics of Israel's calling. In, Israel, in his Isaiah 43, he calls himself, God calls himself the creator of Israel. In Isaiah 51, he says, I've put my words in your mouth and have covered you with the shadow of my hand to establish, literally to plant, same word used that the Lord planted a garden in, 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 in Genesis, to plant the heavens, to found the land, and to say to Zion, you are my people. He's given them his words, the Torah, and sheltered them in order that he might plant the heavens. That is the tabernacle. That is the, the, the land and the place of the domain of blessing. That he might found a land. It's the theology of place. That God may find a place in the fallen world, a, a holy space that represents who he is and what life is to be lived under the dominion of God and to establish a people in whom all of this dwells. So we see this great purpose as it moves from Passover to law, ultimately to witness. But that's not where it ends. That's only, this is only 
stuff that points to these are only the shadows this could only end in failure because it was rooted in law it was rooted in a a system a a a, a uh, what we would call a corpus a body of information that could only serve to condemn This just all points and parallels to something greater that was to come. Because the purpose, the, what, what Passover points to, as we were told, as we read earlier, the purpose of Passover points to Jesus. It points to the cross. It points to the ultimate lamb. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Not a lamb whose blood was sacrificed for Israel, but a lamb who was given to take away the sins of the whole world. This is Christ, our Passover, who was sacrificed for us. But Jesus says something, if you want to look in John 16, Jesus tells us something very interesting that parallels everything that we have been saying. Of course, we know that he said it first, not me. He tells the disciples of this great uh, Last Supper discourse with them. But now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the comforter, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So just as the Passover, the purpose of Passover was Exodus 19, the giving of the law, the purpose of the cross is John 16 and Acts chapter 2, the giving of the Holy Spirit. See, the purpose of the cross was to free man from sin so that Christ could give us the Spirit. The Spirit is life. Without the Spirit, we are still dead in our sins. Without the Spirit, we can, we can be, maybe we're forgiven. But the Spirit means new creation. The Spirit means new life. And the purpose of Pentecost, let's go one step further, just as the purpose of the law was for God's witness in the earth among the Jews, the purpose of the Spirit is for empowerment to witness, to bear witness to Christ, as we are told in Acts 1.8, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Phenomenal thinking here, phenomenal wisdom from God in this incredible transition because I want you to see something, church. When Jesus encountered the woman at the well in John chapter 4, she tangles with Jesus. She says, hey, we worship God here in this mountain, Mount, uh, the Mount of Samaria. But you Jews say that Jerusalem is where you ought to worship. See, it's all about property. It's all about land. And many Christians are still way too preoccupied with a piece of property over in Israel. You see, in the Old Testament, this physical space, this physical piece of property was the domain of blessing. In fact, Alfred Edersheim in the great work Life and times of Jesus the Messiah, the land so precious to the Jews that they believed anybody who died outside of Israel in the resurrection, they would have to roll underground to get within the border of Israel before they could rise from the dead. That's how precious this plot is to them. But Jesus turns 
the woman's argument on her head, on its head. And he says to her, woman, it's not about mountains. It's not about property. What God seeks, what the Father seeks, is those who worship him in spirit and in truth. The giving of the Spirit means that the, the domain of God is no longer to be understood in terms of property. The domain of blessing, the domain of inheritance, we learn from Paul in Ephesians, is the Holy Spirit himself. And wherever that Holy Spirit, that glorious third person of the Trinity, dwells among God's people is holy place is holy domain, is a place where God's blessing and God's fullness can occur. It is the domain of a new creation that is not to be understood in physical property, in law, in, in physical lands, but to be understood through the giving of God's own Son which meant that a divine spirit could be given. And so that ultimately the true planting of the heavens could take place to fulfill this glorious prophecy, the statement of Isaiah in, in, chapter, 50, in uh, chapter 51. So the Lord says to us, just as he said to the Jews, many, many, many centuries ago. I've given you my word. I've covered you, protected you with the shadow of my hand in order that I might plant the heavens among you and that I might have a place among you in the power of the Holy Spirit and to establish a people in whom that glorious spirit dwells. And that who, and, and this is all the, this is all the uh, um, prophetic equivalent to a simple statement made by Jesus in, in Matthew 5. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's what God's called us to. It's not your little light or my little light, but a people formed together by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit that we might reflect the meaning and the glory of heaven here on earth for a lost and dying world. That's what we celebrate today at Pentecost. As the Jews were called to bring forth that first fruits of their harvest, in Acts 2, Peter gave, a, gave a, a great sermon. And 5,000 souls, 3,000 souls came as the first fruits. As a matter of fact, James would later write in James 1.18, we are a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So that great harvest, that day of Pentecost, look, forth, look, look forward to a day when the real first fruits not from a field of produce, but it would be the harvest of many souls, the first fruits of a new creation, of a new harvest of God's doing. Folks, it's been great being with you the last few weeks. I hope you've gathered something from this. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed it, and uh, hopefully we'll have more opportunities. I want to thank you for joining us at the Lord of the Harvest Adult Bible Study. Let's just take a moment to close with prayer. And uh, Father, we thank you for this glorious day and what it means. We thank you, Lord, that your plan is so powerful, so great, and that you are indeed the God of history, leading your plan and purpose along through the ages, that we might be partakers of all that you had purposed from the foundation of the world through Christ and through the giving of the Holy Spirit. I pray your people will be 
experiencing Pentecost today in their own lives, a renewal, an infilling. I pray, Lord, that you'll just continue to bless as Pastor Oz shares the word today. And across this nation, across the world, as pastors and leaders are sharing with their flocks, whether by remote or in person, that there would be a demonstration of Pentecost in the midst of the church for the world to see. Thank you, God. We thank you for your goodness, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. Pastor Oz will be coming on in about 15 minutes. God bless you.